Today, the Standing Committee on Government Operations is holding a public meeting on Bill 61, an act to amend the Ombuds Act. This bill makes several amendments to the Ombuds Act in order to expand the list of authorities that fall within the mandate of the Ombud, clarify the mandate of the Ombud, allow the Ombud to investigate investigate complaints dating back to April 1st, 1999 and provide additional notice requirements including to indigenous, indigenous governments. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the assembly social media channels. As a standing committee, it is our role to review any legislation introduced in the house. The committee review stage provides stakeholders and the public with an opportunity to suggest changes or provide their opinions on whether they support the bill or not. This may encourage committee to consider bringing forward amendments they think may help improve the bill. Committee considers all concerns brought forward when determining how best to proceed. I would like to remind members and witnesses to please direct all comments and questions to myself as chair. This helps us keep the meeting organized and run smoothly. Please wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. I will now ask members to introduce themselves, starting on my left. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Rocky Simpson, MLA, here River South. Online. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Caitlin Cleveland, and I'm the MLA for Cam Lake. Is there anybody else? Lisa, Lisa Semler, MLA for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Are there anybody else? That's it. Okay. I would also, I will now uh, invite the member of Yellowknife North, MLA Johnson, sponsor of this bill, to proceed with his opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Emily Marcellos. Just so the public is aware, I, I am appearing here today as, as a witness, as this is a private member's bill, which I brought forward myself. Uh, and, and perhaps I'll give some kind of history uh, as to how we got here. So the Ombud Act was passed in the last assembly, and committee at that time uh, proposed a number of amendments during clause by clause, some of which you will see here today, and they made a number of recommendations. Uh, the minister at that time did not accept those recommendations. And then so in the Ombuds first annual report, we saw some of those recommendations once again come forward and committee adopted them in their review of the 2019-20 uh, Northwood Dust Territories Ombud annual report. Uh, I, I think it was kind of clear at that time to me that the Ombud Act had the potential to get set on a track which so many of our statutory officer legislations have been on, which is that <laughs> the officer makes recommendations, committee reviews them, accepts those recommendations, bring them forward to the legislature, and then the minister who's responsible for actually bringing those changes into force doesn't really view it as a priority. And, and that can be for a number of reasons. They're not there, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the statutory officers. There's always competing interests in the legislative agenda. But, but I think it's safe to say that it's our hope that all of our statutory officers and our ombud legislation uh, get updated, you know, when there's mistakes and, and they become kind of living legislation, not legislation where I, I think most notoriously we saw uh, an information and privacy commissioner ask for changes to ATIP for over 20 years uh, and it caused a lot of frustration. So I'm hoping with these changes, uh, although small in nature, they can be the beginning of kind of a way that ministers and committees review their statutory officer legislation to make sure that the recommendations that are passed by an assembly are actually implemented. So all of the changes I am bringing forward here today uh, were made initially by the Ombud, passed by this committee in a report, and then approved by the Legislative Assembly. I, I am not bringing forward any uh, changes that are of my own uh, political will. Uh, I, I think the, the chair kind of summarized what they are uh, quite well. They're, they're quite... Uh, technical, I guess. I, I, I'll just go through a couple of them. Uh, I, 
Initially, when the Ombud Act was passed, it, it seemed the list of authorities was largely based on a schedule in the Financial Administration Act. And, and I'm not really sure why, it, but it seemed to have left out a number of things. I think most importantly, uh, it left out housing associations. Uh, the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation Act has this very bar bizarre distinction where we have housing authorities and a housing associations, some of which are nonprofit societies and some of which are creatures of statute. Uh, right now, the Ombud cannot uh, investigate housing associations, which means a number of communities, depending kind of arbitrarily where you are, uh, you can bring your housing complaints forward to the Ombud, and in other communities, you can't. Uh, initially, our Ombud Act also left out a number of contractors to the government, which would be a number of kind of appeal tribunals, uh, the rental officer notably, and uh, it excluded the Human Rights Commission. Uh, I'll note that every single let, uh, Ombud Act across the country, with the exception of Quebec, includes human rights. Uh, it's, it's well established in law that Ombuds have oversight of human rights, and, and rental officers would similarly be included in the majority of jurisdictions. Uh, I, I also want to just emphasize that the Ombud uh, does not have any order making power uh, when they are reviewing things for procedural fairness. They are providing recommendations to bodies. Uh, I, I don't believe there are concerns with, you know, kind of the Ombud <laughs> overstepping their authority and getting into areas. They have a very specific mandate for fairness and ultimately just make recommendations. I would like to commend the Ombud on all of their work to date. Uh, similarly, the Act is uh, amending the power of the Ombud to look back complaints further in time to April 1st, 1999. So that's not just an arbitrary date, it is the date of division. Already the Ombud has expressed uh, that a, a number of files have, you know, were started years and years ago and have kind of carried on to present. And to kind of just have an arbitrary stop date on them, as was initially included in the Ombud Act, uh, kind of makes that review difficult. Uh, I, I think when this was first presented by the government back in the last assembly, there was this floodgates argument. I don't really believe that's a valid uh, argument. The ombud is more than capable of controlling their workload, and you know, it has, if the ombud has a complaint from 1999 that you know was only long resolved, they they do not have to investigate that. They can kind of control their workflow as it comes in, uh, as I I'm sure they are doing. Uh, I think. I do not have anything further to say at this time. Com committee, I, I note, has spent several hours on this bill, you know, meeting with the initial ombud on their initial report, debating different recommendations, passing them in the House, and then ultimately having a, we had a meeting with the minister as well about whether they were willing to bring forward these changes. Uh, they were not in the life of this assembly, and so here we are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, are there any questions from committee members? Caitlin? Go ahead, Caitlin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm wondering um, if MLA Johnson, as the witness today, can speak to any potential concerns that might have been raised either by, um, by the public, by statutory officers themselves, and including the Ombud or um, potentially the GNWT uh, with items in this bill. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I'll note the committee did have a conversation with the minister uh, about our initial recommendations, uh, and that I've had some conversations with the minister. Uh, I, I think it's best to ha let the minister speak, you know, if he wishes to, to any opposition. I, I know it, he, he hasn't taken any strong positions, to my knowledge, and hasn't expressed any overwhelming concern. But uh, And then similarly, I've had conversations with the Ombud. Uh, who, well, they, they are here today, so I think it's probably also best that they, they express their opinions themselves. Other than that, uh, I, I don't believe I have had any conversations with stakeholders, uh, you know, other than, you know, those who have used the Ombud services, I have talked with them generally. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Kevin? Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I, not really a question. I just want to commend uh, Emily Johnson for uh, bringing this forward as uh, a private member's bill. Uh, I don't think we see enough uh, uh, private member's bill as a legislative assembly, so um, just commend him for bringing forward 
you know, these were issues, some, most of which were actually raised in the 18th assembly during the original review of the, 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 the original legislation. And uh, the Ombud, uh, you know, carried out her duties uh, well in the first uh, year and reported back. And this is simply taking those, the recommendations, which uh, actually were reflected in some of the discussion and debate around the, the original bill. And uh, when we got the re response from the government to the, the uh, committee report, uh, basically they said they agreed with some of the recommendations, but we're not gonna, we're, we'll look at it the next time we reopen the bill. <clears throat> well, the next time they reopen the bill could be 20 years from now, based on my experience here. Uh, so uh, again, I think these are uh, help, very helpful changes to uh, improve uh, the ability of the Ombud to carry out uh, her functions and duties and uh, uh, I, I support these and want to commend the, the member again for bringing this forward as a private member's bill. Thanks. And I am curious to know what the position of the Minister is in Cabinet. We haven't heard that and uh, I, you know, I don't think we have anything before us today to indicate uh, but I did see the the government house leader, the minister, get up in the house and say if they weren't quite sure what, what they were going to do about this at second reading, which is not very helpful, but um, I urge all the regular MLAs to work together to get this legislation passed. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, are there any other questions from committee? MLA Simpson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I'm pleased that uh, uh, this has come forward. Uh, you know, the Ombud is, uh, you know, being active for a number of year, couple of years, and then, and I think it's important that uh, we listen to those recommendations and that that she brought forward, because uh, it's uh, that office that's on the ground and knows what information and, and they knows what they have, what they require to do their job properly. Uh, people in Northwest Territories uh, require fairness. Uh, they require that we do our job, uh, you know, uh, correctly and use whatever resources are, are available to us. And, and this will provide the, uh, the Ombuds Office with that. Uh, one question I would have, though, is that it sounds like there will be some additional uh, it could be additional work. Would that, uh, or did you look at the, uh, uh, the requirement for additional staff within the office to take this on, or is that something that uh, would be required? Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I did not look at that specifically. I, I think that would also be a good question for the Ombud. I, I guess I will, my opinion on that is that I, there is always a push from all of our statutory officers to have increased staffing. Uh, you know, they want to do their job well and that, that's up to the board of management to, you know, sometimes push back. Uh, I don't think the appropriate method for asking our statutory officers to limit their workload or to prioritize which files need to be done in which order uh, it is through the legislation. I, it just doesn't make sense to me to say, we're worried about the staffing, so we're going to give you half the authority that all other ombuds across Canada have. Uh, I, I think the correct solution is to make sure they have a proper Ombud Act, they have proper legislation, and then it becomes largely an issue of the statutory officers and the Board of Management uh, going back and forth to make sure that the workload is prioritized and you know that is reviewed. Uh, you know, Arguably, that expanding the list of authorities is, is inherently more work for the Ombud. Uh, they will get more complaints. Uh, I will leave it to the Ombud to speak whether you know that is a, gonna create an immediately pressing need to more staff or whether they are, are you know, presently sufficiently staffed. But, but I don't think a, a solution to you know, that ongoing debate with all our statutory officers is to say, well, you're just gonna have you know, kind of half the, the Ombud Act that everyone else gets. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other comments or anything for our committee? No. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Committee, we will now hear from a witness that wishes to speak to Bill 61. 
an act to amend the Ombud Act. I would like to invite the Northwest Territories Ombud to the chair. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Colette Langlois. I am the Ombud for the Northwest Territories. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 61, an act to amend the Ombud Act. Um, I am grateful to Tam L.A. Johnson and, and everybody who worked on this to, to bring it forward. I, I think it might be record time for statutory officer legislation, so I, I, I do appreciate that. I know there are a lot of different priorities around, so um, it's, uh, it's appreciated for sure. Uh, the bill, as you're aware, does address several of the recommendations that were in the 2019-2020 annual report. And if passed, it will close some gaps in the act that will help us better serve the public. So there have been instances, and I'll provide some more context about that in my remarks, where people have asked us to look into something and we haven't been able to because of a, a gap in the legislation. Uh, I, I won't comment on every clause in the bill, but uh, I will, will speak to uh, in, in a little more detail to a few of them. And I'll start with, with the mandate. As you're aware, the current act includes a schedule of authorities the act applies to. Um, if an authority is not specifically mentioned on that list, we can't look into complaints about it. So this does leave a lot of territorial public services that people have contacted us about out. Um, the, the example that comes up frequently is housing associations, so we can look into housing authorities but not housing associations. And this is not at all theoretical. I was in a NUVIC last week, somebody was talking to me about a concern they had with public housing and asking me if it was the sort of thing we could look at, and I said yes. And then they told me it was actually, because in Inuvik they have a housing authority, and it was actually on behalf of a relative who lived in another community in the Beaufort Delta where they're all housing associations, and then I had to say, no, actually we can't. Um, so, you know, this, and, and we've had in the past calls about housing associations as well, so it's, it's hard for members of the public to understand. You know, in principle it seems like something an ombud could look at, but how come in that community down the road we can't, and, you know, in, in this community we can uh, similarly, we can deal with concerns about departments and health authorities, but we can't follow up on concerns about bodies like the Human Rights Office, the Rental Office, um, uh, Staffing Appeals Officers, Committees for things like Social Assistance Appeals, uh, Employment Standards, and, and the staffing, staffing Reviews. So, and again, it's not that we get a lot of complaints about those, and I don't know if the complaints we have had were substantiated because I couldn't couldn't look into them, um, and that's that's the concern there. Uh, so, the proposed changes would bring us into line with how the legislation is done in other provinces and territories, and in the future, it would capture any new agencies that get created if somebody forgets to to add them to the schedule, um, so they won't they won't get overlooked. Some of the authorities that are under the office's mandate might be described as, as administrative tribunals. And I have heard, you know, sometimes some questions about, you know, what the relationship is with ombuds and administrative tribunals. So I thought I would try to, to clear that up. So examples of those would be any of the appeal bodies I just mentioned for social assistance, um, employment standards, staffing, um, and, uh, and the human rights adjudication panel. So, you know, I did take a look at, at some of the reports that have come out from other jurisdictions about administrative tribunals, and the, the issues that come up are about service delivery. So they're not the kinds of things that end up in the front of the courts. It's, it's things like, um, nobody returned my call, or I couldn't get anybody to, to answer the phone or answer my message. Uh, you know, it took a long time. There was an unreasonable delay. Or the process was really inaccessible. I couldn't get information that I understood. There wasn't anything plain language available. Uh, they said I had to come in person and I can't get there in person or they wanted me to mail it and I live in a remote place that's going to take a long time to get there. So those are really service delivery issues. What, what ombuds don't do, they're not an appeal or a substitute decision maker for any of those bodies. I, it's not like the courts, you know, that can sometimes overturn a decision by, by one of those bodies. Um, that's something the courts do, that's not something, that's not something that, uh, that we would do. But what ombuds do is fill a gap by, by dealing with some of those service issues that, that nobody else really can. 
if we find a process was really unfair or a decision was based on a mistake or irrelevant grounds uh, and the appeal period or if there there was an appeal period has expired the most we could do is recommend that the body reconsider the decision based on what we found but we can't overturn it or change it so nothing nothing like what the courts do we don't make any kinds of orders just recommendations so I, I hope that that clears up any any questions that uh, um, members of the public or, or members here might have had about that. Uh, you will have seen in my written submission that I suggested a complementary change to the definition of administrative head. So this is a little bit technical, but currently administrative heads are defined as deputy ministers or CEOs, which works for almost every authority that's on that list right now. However, if the administrative head of the organization doesn't have the title deputy minister or, or chief executive officer, then what happens is the ombud has to ask the minister to designate who that person is. So before the act came into force, I went down that list and I, I figured out which ones of these uh, were not going to be covered and it was only a couple and I wrote letters to the ministers to try and get, get answers to those. And it's not, you know, ministers' offices are busy and it's, it's a strange question perhaps that, that doesn't come up often. So, you know, it took, it took a couple months in, uh, in some cases to get responses and sometimes I had to, to follow up a couple times in one instance. So it is helpful to be able to identify them ahead of time and that is a really important term because that's who the office has to notify uh, of an investigation that's who we have to provide a copy of the report to there's a lot of other procedural requirements for example if I was going to attend a facility that's operated by that um, that organization I have to notify the administrative head ahead of time I can't just show up and say give us all your files um, so so it is a really important term and it's important to have certainty about it um, so I did suggest some wording in my written submission to include the phrase executive head, which I, I got from the two jurisdictions that have the most similar approach to this as, as us, that's PEI and Saskatchewan. There are some other jurisdictions that don't uh, define administrative head at all, so it's certainly not the only way to do it, but it did seem like a possible solution. It's not impossible to work around, it's just that it could, could delay some complaints and I think if the bill were to receive third reading and, and there was no change made, I would just make sure I had some letters ready to go um, for if the bill received dissent so I could uh, get those off to ministers because I know I'll get calls about housing associations right away for example and there's, there's a few other authorities I would want to have cleared up right away as well. Um, just um, if I could make a few comments as well on, on the temporal jurisdiction. So that's the change allowing us to, to go back to 1999. Uh, as currently we can't look at matters from before 2016. Uh, I have heard this argument that it, this could open the floodgates to, to a lot of complaints. And I, d I just want to say that's, that's not a concern. I, I don't believe that will happen. I, in most cases, once a couple of years have gone by, it's very difficult to gather evidence. Um, staff involved might have retired. They've moved on. They might just not remember a conversation, especially if there's no paperwork to go with it. So even, you know, we sometimes get calls, somebody will say, you know, two years ago I was in somebody's office and they told me I was entitled to this and now they're saying I'm not. And, you know, nobody's going to remember that from two years ago, especially if there's no, no documentary trail, let alone 20 years ago. Um, you know, records might be destroyed if there were no documents created. If enough time's gone by, it will have passed the retention schedule. And there is discretion in the Act to refuse complaints that are more than a year old. So it's not that this is, I, I think this will only come up in a handful more cases, but there have been a few exceptional cases where if we had had the authority to go back further, it would have made a lot of sense because what we ended up doing was investigating starting in the middle of the story at an arbitrary time, which was January 1st, 2016. And sometimes the roots of the issue might have gone back a few years earlier to when a mortgage was signed, uh, you know, when, when a business loan was signed. This is documented, those reports are public now. We we have the, uh, the report on the business assistance programs and the report on the housing assistance programs and in both those cases it would have been really helpful to go back and look at kind of what the roots of the issue that we ended up um, dealing with later on uh, were because there might there might have been something else that would have been been helpful for for resolving those issues um, 
So instead, we just we dealt with the events that occurred occurred afterward and made recommendations about those. Um, so it is those things like financial and property transactions. So you know it could be a lands uh, lands transaction, uh, mortgage with the housing corporation, business loans, and other other financial transactions. Those are those are at least they should be really well documented and and those records should be kept. And even if there aren't any officials who are around at the time, we might be able to get all the evidence we need based just on the records. We might. Um, the, the issue now is we don't even have the opportunity to try or to look and, and see what's there. So again, I, I, I can assure um, everyone that this change won't lead to a flood of complaints, at least not ones that we can, we can follow up on. Uh, but I expect it will continue to make a difference in a, in a few exceptional cases going into the future. And of course, you know, 2016 is getting, we're getting further and further away from that. It's receding more and more into the distance. So, you know, it, it won't come up as often. But I, I, I do think um, this is important and it, uh, it could help us um, in a couple of cases at least. Uh, I did also, in my written submission, make a few comments on the definition of, of the mandate that I, I would like to elaborate on. So the bill does include a rewording of subsection 15.1, which is the core of our mandate, and I do think it's much clearer and easier to follow than, than the existing wording in the bill. Um, as I noted in the written submission, I'm not sure of the intent of specifically mentioning implementation of a policy as part of our mandate. I haven't seen that in any other legislation, and it is something that we're able to do already. Uh, so how a policy is implemented, it's one kind of matter of administration. It's something we look at routinely. Um, we're doing that, and we have the authority to do that. So we've done it with corrections policies. Um, uh, the affirmative action policy and other HR policies, making sure they're being followed, uh, business incentive policy, income assistance policies, just a long, long list of, of policies we've looked at. Um, so I, I would suggest that extra wording might not be needed, and I am a little concerned that mentioning a specific kind of matter of administration might lead to a narrow interpreter of the na narrower interpretation of the mandate sometime in the future. I don't know what the risk of that is, but um, I, I, I'm just, I guess I'm just not clear on the intent of, uh, of including that wording in there. Um, the additional notice provisions, I, I do support the amendments for, for additional notices of investigations and reports to Indigenous governments. And you know, there the office's interest is just that whatever the direction is, it's clear enough so we can we know who we need to contact and when. It's about having certainty and fairness in our, in our own processes. And I, I think that wording achieves it. Um, as I noted in my written submission, I, I believe this amendment would remove the need for the wording in subsection 42.2 of the Act. Uh, that's something I made a recommendation about in my first report as well, and that's the wording that makes the Ombuds policies and procedures subject to policies of the office of the clerk. Um, and that, that wording did concern me when I made the recommendation, and it's still concerning to me now. It's, it's very broad. Um, I'm concerned about the implications for the independence of the office, because it could be very far-reaching the way it's worded. Um, there isn't anything like it in any of our other statutory officer legislation uh, or in any other ombuds legislation that I've seen in Canada. My understanding is that the intent of that provision, and this is my understanding from the Standing Committee's May 2021 report on the 2019-2020 annual report, um, so my understanding from that report was the reason that was put in there was to ensure that the Clinchon government was notified about investigations into the Clinchon Community Services Agency because that, that wasn't addressed in the, um, in the act as it was passed in 2018. Um, so that's the only explanation I've ever heard for that provision and if, if that, that's the reason then I, I think that's achieved by this bill because it is dealing with that notice to all Indigenous governments, not only the, the Clinchon government. So my recommendation is that it's an opportunity to, to amend that at the same time. Uh, so that's almost uh, the end of my remarks, Madam Chair. In closing, I, I and thank you for, for members for, for your patience uh, as I go through some of the, the details. As you, I hope you can see, I'm really passionate about this, and I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm anxious to, to be able to, to help more people with, with the work we do. So I, I do support the bill. Um, 
you know, particularly because of the gaps it it closes in our in our service to the public. Um, you know, it 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 feels bad. You know, when we have to turn someone away when they have complaints that fit with our mandate, as we've described it, and and you know, the housing associations are a great example of that. And it's really hard to explain why why we're not helped able to help in a case like that, or or with the rental office. So this bill closes a lot of gaps, and, and if it's passed, I think it will certainly help us help the public, and that's that's what we're here for. Um, so, Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks on Bill 61, and I would be happy to answer any questions or hear any comments that, that members might have. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, committee, are there any questions for the Ombud? MLA O'Reilly? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks for the um, letter and your presentation. Um, I just want to pick up on, uh, I think it's the second point in your letter about um, that the mandate of the uh, Ombud is set out in Section 15 uh, of the uh, legislation. Um, the revised wording that's been suggested in the private member's bill <clears throat> um, You've suggested, I think, probably dropping the words, and I'm looking at the actual bill, and so it's clause three of the bill that would amend 15.1, um, and 15.1a, I guess it says, relates to a matter of administration or the implementation of a policy. So just so I'm clear, you, you would suggest that it reads something like re relates to a matter of administration of a policy? Is that uh, what you were getting at? Thanks, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my suggestion would be that it just say relates to a matter of administration, semicolon, and um, matter of administration includes implementation of a policy. That's one kind of matter of administration. Are there any yeah, supplementary? Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Madam Chair. Okay, that's clear for me, and I'd be okay with that. I think <laughs> you can probably blame me for this because I'm the one that was trying at the time. This is this is, I think, what we had tried to propose in the 18th Assembly when the the bill was coming forward, and it was an attempt to try to negotiate, convince cabinet that this was not going to be some all-encompassing thing that was going to lead to the ombud looking over the shoulder every time they did something. So it was to try to, you know, define what the, the mandate was in a way that they might find acceptable. Unfortunately, they didn't agree and we got some ridiculous, <laughs> some very vaguely worded stuff that's not very clear. So. I'd be fine uh, with, I think, what the uh, Ombud has suggested here uh, in terms of a, a further amendment. I uh, appreciate the, the input and the time. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. MLA O'Reilly, do you have any comment, uh, Ms. Lekwa? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and perhaps um, just if it's, if it's helpful, I would point to Section 33 of the, of the Act. Because fairness isn't defined anywhere in, uh, and of course, fairness is our is our mandate. That's that's what's commonly understood that ombuds deal with. It's not um, defined anywhere in the Act. Section 33 is about the closest that you get to that, and that's the section that lists all the kinds of findings we can make after doing an investigation. So one of those findings is that something, a decision, recommendation, act, or omission that was the subject matter of the investigation was, and I'm reading 33 sub 1a sub paragraph 3 here, uh, but it's that something was made, done, or omitted under a statutory provision or other rule of law or practice that is unjust, unreasonable, oppressive, or improperly discriminatory. Um, so if you're looking at that, or if you're, um, you know, if a practice is, is unjust, unreasonable, oppressive, or um, sorry, improperly discriminatory, then that, that's, you know, that's the area that's covering implementation of a policy. Because if the policy wasn't done according, or if the policy itself is, is discriminatory, or if it's not following a policy, all of these things are, um, are, are covered in Section 33. And I'm sorry, I'm tripping over the wording because it is really jargony. But um, that's, that's where we're finding our authority to, to do these things. So it's helpful to read Section 15 with, with that as well. I probably just made it 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions from committee? Uh, I just have one one comment to make. Uh, I know that taking all these, because you know, there's a lot of uh, mis uh, injustice and a lot of unfairness done within uh, government. Uh, and uh, taking all these extra files, uh, I'm sure that uh, there's going to need be a need for extra staff. You know, with, uh, and um, I I want to make sure that. Uh, I don't know how we do it, but uh, if that happens, uh, that you come, uh, if we have to accommodate that, we want to do that because a lot of uh, uh, issues that come to MLAs uh, many times are uh, are people that are never would never get through the front door, okay? And uh, we have to be able to address that. It's extremely important. That's what we're here for. And uh, I hear it all the time, and I support the changes within this bill. Uh, with that, uh, do you have any comment, or are there any other uh, witnesses that want to come forward or present, or, or is, how about online? Do they, does anybody want to say anything? No? No. Okay. So I want to thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, no, thank you for raising that, Madam Chair. I think it does raise a question. I'd like to hear the the um, audit, or sorry, the auditor. Uh, the ombud. We've been dealing with a lot of statutory officers this week. So sorry, and I, I know we got the ombud in front of me uh, here. So, um, but uh, no, I think the chair raised an interesting issue here. One of the concerns that we heard in the last assembly, and I think we may hear again, is this issue of opening the floodgates. So there are a number of changes proposed, I think, in this bill that would, you know, increase the uh, um, your ability to look back in time. So you may get more complaints, maybe a bit more work that you have to do. You would have maybe some additional um, government entities that you might have a mandate to actually look into this issue of fairness. You, know, you mentioned local housing associations. Um, and uh, so do you, at this point, knowing that these changes could happen, do you think you would still, and I, I, I realize I'm asking you a, an issue of uh, your judgment here, but do you think you can still operate and, and fulfill your duties with the existing budget complement? Or is it something you kind of have to see after a year or something? But uh, I think I heard you say that you were, weren't worried about the floodgates on going back, so I just want to get you on the record about whether you think this is going to create so much additional work that you're going to need an increase in your budget or staffing to allow you to do this, but I, I guess I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, the the budget requests I take those for to the to the Board of Management. So you know, I'm I'm always monitoring um, because you know this is a new office as well. I monitor year over year, and we do get a modest complaint uh, increase every year. So it's it's growing, and it's really hard to say at what point does that mean that we need we need a, a new position. I think you know even with the increased mandate, um, with the resources I have. In the office now, I think we'd be able to to meet that. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, are there any other witnesses that wish to present? No. None. Okay. With that, hearing none, this concludes the public portion of the meeting. So.